Koi, uh, everybody. Uh, good morning. I noticed I was just texting an old friend there, Chris. I noticed Chris Pitts on the on the line here. Uh, Chris and I kind of go back a little ways with the First Nation Forestry Program, but it's good to see him on here. Uh, it's been a while since we've seen each other, but um, uh, I'm here this morning. I was asked by Pam there are several occasions to, to come in and participate on some of these uh, learning from the land sessions and our first kick at the can uh, to actually go out in the land kind of uh, uh, got some uh, hurdles put into it simply because of COVID. Yes. Uh, Steve, you have to forgive me. I can't let you continue without acknowledging where we are. Oh, yes. Of course, uh, we're in Mi'kmaq territory, uh, uh, the land of uh, uh, the Covenant Treaties. Uh, it re we're representative of uh, seven First Nation communities, um, but we are definitely in Mi'kmaq territory. Yeah. Uh, provincially and regionally or geographically Eastern Canada, we are in the Wabanaki territory. Uh, Wabanaki is uh, the four, the four, uh, the four tribes of Eastern Canada. And of course they make up the Mi'kmaq, uh, the Malisets, the Pasquewatigans and the Penobscots. Super. Um, so there's, uh, I'll get into that as, as in more detail as I go into this uh, presentation. Thank you, Steve. Uh, but for those who don't know me on, uh, on this call, my name is uh, Steve Ganesh. I'm from the uh, Nagawaganek First Nation. Uh, Nagawaganek uh, translated means land plentiful of eels. And I was first asked to speak about eels, but uh, I said I'll speak about forestry since uh, that's my background, but I have extensive fishery knowledge on, uh, on uh, uh, in the fishery field simply because I, I fished all my life. I am a, a class two fishing captain. I do operate a lot of the fisheries. And I'm, I'm a holder of the f first uh, exploratory sea bass commercial license uh, where we're trying to uh, control uh, the uh, uh, overpopulation of the striped bass in the Miami River. Uh, I work for an organization uh, known as Mi'kmaq Well Tablutahan. And Mi'kmaq Well Tablutahan uh, translates into uh, uh, people's law. And this is a treaty right based organization uh, where we look at uh, implementation and education and creating awareness around our treaties. I'm the forester natural resource uh, director and uh, this organization is about five years old and we have been working quite extensively on, on bringing uh, our treaties uh, forward. Um, uh, to the next one, Pam. Oh, great. What I'm going to talk about uh, this morning, of course, who we are as an organization. I'm definitely going to talk about uh, the Mi'kmaq treaties, what they are. And I'm going to give an overview of the treaties, even though it's just going to be a brief overview, you're going to find there's more information here than uh, what you expect. But if you really looked at uh, the treaties, they are very involved and they are, they're, they're, they're a covenant line of treaties. And most of the time when the Mi'kmaq people talk about our treaties, we talk about the Rabanaki Confederacy. Uh, government, industry, uh, a lot of agencies like to split us up, uh, be it Mi'kmaq territory or, or, or Willistokan territory or Pasquaran territory. But the treaties were signed uh, based on the Wabanaki Confederacy, where, our four, where, our, where the four tribes of uh, Eastern Canada uh, lived in harmony for you know tens of thousands of years, and it was not until the arrival of uh, uh, the French and the British that all of a sudden uh, we were divided, based on uh, what we would call colonialism, in their efforts to, uh, uh, as I would say, divide and conquer. I'm going to talk about forestry, of course, uh, since my background is forester uh, is, is forestry. I've been in forestry ever since I was a. Uh, uh, a knee high to a grasshopper, uh, both in a cultural way and an educational way and in a management way. And I'm going to talk about uh, how, how I see or how we see things moving forward. Okay, next one. Uh, Mi'kmaq Well to Blue uh, we represent, uh, uh, we have a nine member Mi'kmaq community uh, membership within our organization. And of course, it, re it represents the, uh, the nine. Uh, Mi'kmaq communities along the eastern coast of the uh, Kaskapedian territory. 
in the Sikwankin territory. Uh, up into the north, of course, is Evil Bard and Tabano, uh, Elsa Buktuk, uh, Burn Church, uh, Eel Ground, Nagalogadek, Mebinagia, uh, which is Red Bank, uh, Linumashku, which is Indian Island, uh, Elsa Buktuk, Big Cove, uh, Buktushin, uh, Fort Folly. Fort Folly is, is then, of course, down by Dorchester. Next one. Uh, I said earlier, uh, Mi'kmaq Well to it, uh, it translates into Mi'kmaq people's law or how we govern ourselves. And that organization is totally uh, focused on treaty implementation, uh, recognizing the treaty and how we fit uh, our treaties into uh, today's society, uh, into all uh, functions of government, uh, be it the Environment Assessment Act or whatever. How do we, how do we uh, make changes in order to uh, ensure that the protection of Aboriginal treaty rights are at the forefront uh, of our uh, society. Our organization, we represent nine Mi'kmaq communities in New Brunswick. Uh, like I said, the man, uh, mandate is to ensure our rights are recognized, protected and affirmed on behalf of our member communities. Now, some of our, uh, Elsa Buktuk uh, has a consultation body, which is known as Gobit Lodge and uh, Gobit Lodge, uh, uh, normally moves forward with any consultations for that community, but Elsa Buktuk is a, is a member of, a, of a Mi'kmaq Well to Bluktahan. How we do this, uh, we have three main ways. Uh, of course, we do have trilateral and bilateral uh, negotiation for both levels of government, be it uh, you know the federal or the provincial government. Uh, we also have a, a consultation and an accommodation process uh, that sometimes is directed to industry dependent on the uh, be, be tend, be, uh, dependent on the relationship that's being forged by uh, the First Nations and by uh, uh, industry. And the one we don't like to take too often, but sometimes we're forced to take, and it's simply because we're never listened to, or there's just a business as usual attitude by government industry. Uh, but sometimes we have to go down the road of litigation. And I'll talk about one particular case when it comes to where we're heading with uh, litigation. Our mission statement, of course, very... Uh, uh, straightforward. We're, we are Lenu people. We're a Lenu leadership body whose every effort is to protect and, and implement, uh, inherit uh, Aboriginal treaty rights. And we facilitate this by lead to culture, economic, and social well-being. Um, to rebuild our strength as a people thinking of the future by remembering the past, uh, but not living in the past. You know, past is very important to understand, but at the same time, we have to change or we have to take what we know of the past and, and, and bring it into modern days thinking. And of course, we have to work in the develop relationship for government but at all levels, relationships with all levels of, uh, of, uh, of society as a whole, because you've got to remember our treaties were signed. Uh, there's not one signatory to the treaties. We are treaty people. We all are. Everybody in this country are treaty people. Uh, we, uh, the treaties were signed among us all. And our history is great. Uh, you know the latest find in uh, the latest find in New Brunswick. Uh, some of them go back as far as uh, up in the you know the Madawaska territory area to, back to 10,000, 12,500 years. With the latest one being found in, at the Caribou ambush site down in Shepany, uh, down in the Funday Coast area, but that goes back to 4,800 years. And if you look at European time clock when it comes to uh, you know, the arrival of Christ and all, and uh, the, you know, the Romans and all that, when it comes to the timeline, that's always showed by uh, Europeans of how uh, mankind survived. And you compare that to the First Nation timeline, it's it, 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 the First Nation timeline, the North American timeline, when it comes to our people, go back so much further. And, and it's interesting to see where, you know, it's, gr it's great when you sit down and you hear, you hear family stories about, uh, ancestors going back five, six, seven generations. Well, mine go back 130 generations. So you put that in perspective of how, how, how we're so attached to the land here when it comes to our people. Now, uh, of course, we have a pictogram here of a moose uh, that goes back 4,000 years. That's, of course, down in Ketchumikuchi uh, National Park there in Nova Scotia. And uh, uh, I don't know if anybody in, uh, on the group here knows how to do a moose call. Uh, but the language of the moose is, uh, is very unique. Uh, and uh, 
I was going to challenge some of you to try to do a moose call, but uh, I don't know if you can. But I'm going to do one real quick, so you can you can hear what 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 a what a what a what a female moose and what a what a bull moose sounds like when 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 uh, when when the uh, when it, well they they make these sounds all the time, but they're definitely more prevalent during the uh, during the uh, uh, the mating season. Uh, and uh, you know we all know the bulls grow enormous antlers to showcase their uh, their strength and their genetics and stuff like that. And of course, the uh, the female moose are, are very particular in who they choose as a mate. So the male moose got to really put on a show for them in order to uh, uh, be the chosen one, I so to speak. But I'm going to do a call here real quick because I, I understand there might be some young people on the uh, uh, on the call as well. And uh, normally, when I'm out on the land, when we have these type of workshops. Or these type of gatherings, I actually uh, uh, challenge or have a little contest where I give a compass or something to the kids or something uh, of cultural basket or something. And I, I usually say, you know, whoever got us the best moose call by the end of the day, I said, we'll do one right now, but by the end of the gathering, we'll have a, 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 a moose call and contest if you want to call it, just to kind of uh, uh, end the day. And they all look forward to it because as we're going through the woods, looking at specific trees and stuff like that, you can hear the kids in the background practicing their moose call. So when the time comes at the end of the session, they're all ready. So I'm going to do a cow call real quick, and then I'll do a bull call. I have normally have a bull we respond. So uh, don't get too scared. Uh, it's just me. It's not a real moose, uh, but most people. But believe me, I've been in the woods before hunting, and I can hear people hunting. And I'll do the call, and next thing I become the hunted. And uh, I usually got to uh, say the person's name at the end of my call so they know that it's me, that it ain't, uh, it ain't, it ain't an action animal. So here's, here's, a, here's, a, here's a cow call. That's a cow call. Oh, look, look at this. See, I, I brought two animals over right now and they heard that. I got two, <laughs> two German shepherds in front of me. Uh, they come running right out of the room. Uh, but that's a cow call, uh, and, and and normally when you do that call, you'll get a you'll get a, a response from the bull, and the bull is just a simple grunt, and he'll go he'll come back on he'll go like this. Ah, ah, ah. Now if you if you if you really if you really uh, kind of tee off that bull, he'll come back really aggressive, and he'll come back and he sound he'll sound like one pissed off Saint Bernard dog. He actually sounds like a St. Bernard bar dog. He'll come back, he'll go, ah, ah, and he'll come back just, my German Shepherd's just looking at me now, they're ready to attack me. <laughs> See, look at, but uh, 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 when you hear that call, that just tells you to back off. When you've got a bull coming in and they're making noise like that, that tells you to back off. But there's so many other languages that the moose uses, like people will do a moose call and they don't understand how come the animal ain't coming out to them? How come the animal ain't coming out to them? Because you're only saying one little aspect of that animal's language that you're not having a conversation with him or her. You, you, you're not having a conversation. You're just throwing something out there and expect them to fill in all the blanks. There's so many other things you can do to actually make that animal uh, come right to you. And literally it'll write to you. And, uh, I remember having a forester out there, uh, kind of my mentor, his name was Robert Scott, and he's retired, I mean, he's retired, he's still with us, but he was in, works for the, he worked for the Irvins, he worked for the Rosses, he worked for the province, he worked for the feds, he was a licensed scaler, he handled about 200,000 cubic meters of fiber every year. And I remember he was cutting out, we were cutting out a block of wood and uh, uh, up, up here in eel ground. And, Normally, when you got machines in the woods, it would attract it would attract the the animals because the animals are curious. They'll come out. They won't step right out, but they'll come out and you'll notice them. And then uh, uh, all of a sudden, uh, there was a moose standing about five hundred feet away from us, and it was a it was a, it was what 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 a hunter would call a twelve a twelve point bull. It was a young mature bull. Now my dogs are going crazy here. Go lay down. So, anyways. Uh, uh, he said that was the first moose he's seen that close. I said, really, Bob, in the 50 years you're in the woods, you never got real close to a moose. And he said, no, Steve, I haven't. So I said, watch this. And it wasn't, it wasn't the, the rut, the rut was coming on. So I start doing some, start talking to the moose, I would say. And I brought the moose right to the truck, 
where, where Bob was. And he was so scared. And I said, Bob, I'll, I'll back it off. And, and, it, and I would do something, the moose will take off. I said, I could bring it back. And so I do a, a certain call again, and he comes back again. And uh, Bob was amazed at the fact that you can talk to a moose that way. Because he said, mostly they'll come in and you'll scare them off. But not if you know what you're doing. If you really understand the language of, of, of an animal, of any person, of anything out there, you can, uh, you, you can, you can uh, 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 say anything to them. And I learned a lot of that uh, because I, when I was young, uh, my father passed away when I was a young man, I'm a young boy. And my mother was non-Indigenous, uh, but my father was a, a Mi'kmaq uh, Indian chief. And, uh, and uh, I'm getting pushed here now by my dogs. He won't leave me alone. I should have done that call, but anyways. <laughs> so anyways, uh, uh, you guys go lay down. Go lay down. So anyway, not the uh, only dogs. The half the chats lighting up with their pets are going nuts in their homes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but he's just staring me right down. There. He's he, he, uh, my dog's name is Gogowedge. His name is Crow because he was pitch black when he was uh, when he was born. He was pitch pitch black. His name is Gogowedge. Uh, uh, but he's a fully trained German Shepherd, and he's unbelievable. Now he's trying to talk to me. He wants me to go outside, but of course I can't leave this. Uh, they're going away now. So, anyways, when my father passed away, uh, you know, I, he was always the one who took me in the woods and stuff like that. But my mother didn't understand the culture because she was not indigenous, and so I used to go up the woods when I was 11, 12, 13, 14 years old, and I used to stay there for uh, weeks on end. And I used to tell my mom, I'm going up the woods. My mom will be back home in a couple of days or in a couple of weeks. I said, don't worry about me. I'll be fine. But I used to go up there just for the fishing rod and some snares and stuff like that. And I used to go up there and, and just kind of survive off the land. But because I was out there all the time, I heard all the animals. I heard all the birds. I listened to them. And I, and I, learned, I learned their language. So uh, uh, I never showed a lot of this stuff to people when I was growing up simply because I, I valued I valued the protection of the animals too. And so I didn't want a lot of people to, a lot of people to understand their language because then some people will just go up and abuse it. And that goes for anybody, you know, we all have bad apples in all our communities and all our societies. So I kind of restrained from, uh, from uh, showing too many people uh, the language of a lot of animals. But I got, uh, I uh, learned my son to call bobcats. I learned my son to call lynx. He knows how to call those animals right to him. Uh, uh, he's, I think he's the only partridge hunter that always goes up when people say there's no partridge in the woods and he can bring partridge home because he knows their language and uh, he can bring them right out. Like they'll come right out to the road. They're unbelievable. You can just stand by the road. Next thing you'd be, you'd be chirping away like the partridge do. And next thing you know, there's some partridge out on the road. He, you just learn those because you're part, you, I, I kind of could put myself into that, into that, uh, uh, into that scenario into that uh, environment and, and learn the language of the animals. Uh, my wife kind of laughs at me when I'm sitting outside in the porch and the, the crows and the uh, seagulls are around here and I can get them sitting right on the trees because I can talk their language. They'll come right down and sit on the trees and it's unique watching that. Uh, but I don't show it a lot simply because like I said, a lot of people abuse that. And uh, I, uh, I try to, uh, uh, pass that on to people that I know that will respect the, uh, respect the, uh, the wildlife and respect uh, uh, the animals. It's the same thing with fishing. Uh, people find it funny, I can catch fish where people can't catch fish. <laughs> and um, I'm, I'm not, uh, but my father learned me at a very young age of how to help fish uh, when it comes to where you think the populations are down or how in the fall time that whatever you take from the water, whatever you take from the, the river, you put back into the water. And I remember my father used to always take uh, uh, a bucket with him every, every fall time. And he used to catch uh, salmon in the fall time for salt him, salt him in the wintertime. Uh, because the eggs were ready and, and the, the fish were ready to spawn and we're in a, in a unique part of the river where the fish did spawn, that he, he would ensure that the, the eggs stayed in the river and that the eggs were fertilized. Uh, if you cut a male and female, so the, the young were actually put back into the river, even though we, the, he harvested the, uh, the spawning fish uh, because of, of food needs, but he still ensured that the, uh, that the eggs and all that, that the females were carrying and that any males that he cut, he used to, used to milk the eggs right there on the shore and, and put them right back into the river. 
I still do that to this day. If I fish foul fish, I, I still do carry out that practice. Uh, but no, I, like I was saying, our mission statement goes back, uh, uh, you know, is about uh, protecting our people and protecting our treaties and then making sure that uh, uh, it's the well be well-being of all people. Uh, Mi'kmaq is actually a French word, if people realize. We are Lenu, uh, but a lot of people say, well, the Mi'kmaq people, the Mi'kmaq people, or Mi'kmaq, Mi'kmaqi. You hear the word Mi'kmaqi a lot. Mi'kmaqi is actually a French word that means allies. It means allies. And before the British were here, uh, the first treaties were signed with the French in, in the early 1600s. And you'll see when I get further in that, uh, what I mean by that. Uh, so Pam, could you move to the next one? I gotta let this dog out real quick. He's chewing on my hand. Come on, come on. Out. You guys stand here. Sorry about that, but they were chewing on my hand. I'm gonna to touch upon the treaties here. Of course, uh, uh, a lot of you are aware that uh, treaty rights and Aboriginal rights are recognized and affirmed in section 35 of the uh, Constitution Act of 1982. Uh, uh, these treaties uh, were to support peace and friendship between the Indian, Indian nations and the, and the settlers. Um, rights of indigenous people, European, you're coming living on land occupied by Indian, uh, indigenous people. Uh, you're, you know, these treaties were signed based on the fact that uh, they were uh, uh, signed based on the sharing of the land, sharing of the resources, and not to infringe upon or in interfere with Indigenous people's rights to the land. And there was various treaties signed over since 1725 right up to 1767, simply because of the infringements that were being made against the First Nation people. And uh, uh, I'll discuss, uh, as we move on a bit, I'll discuss that a little bit further, uh, what I mean by that, because the city of Halifax, uh, uh, a new treaty was signed around that, around that after 1770, 25 and 26, it was signed in 1753, simply because of the infringements that was made on First Nation people resulted in the uh, creation of Halifax. And there's a unique story around that. So uh, I'll show you that. But of course, there's treaties across Canada, depending on the time were signed in circumstances. And across Canada, there's, our, there, there's over 70 historical treaties uh, signed uh, with 364 nations between 1701 and 1923. So uh, this country was built on treaties. This country was built on, 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 on First Nations willingness to uh, you know, include uh, uh, the settle uh, the settlement, but we were not conquered, and society as a whole think we were a conquered race. We're not conquered. Uh, the treaties in the east are a lot stronger than the treaties in the rest. But the reason why there's so much activity in the in the west are the fact that the treaties are still being forged out there. There's still new treaties being forged, and one that comes into into thinking here, of course, is the Nishkan Treaty uh, that was signed. Uh, back in the, the late, late, late 80s, early 90s, where they obtained 1,600 square kilometers of uh, uh, territory. But if you talk to the, uh, the, the leaders out there that that treaty still needs proper implementation, but at the same time, they gave up 1.6 million uh, hectares uh, of land in order to ensure that they had 1,600 square kilometers of, uh, of, uh, of land uh, that was theirs. Uh, in, 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 the, in the days of modern thinking. Um, next one, Pam. Of course, uh, some of the encounters with the Europeans, and uh, if, you, if you know a little bit about history, of course, the first, the first thing that brought the Europeans here with a fish, uh, the, the cod, the cod that was out in the ocean and stuff like that, is that fishermen, fishermen from Por uh, Portugal, Europe, uh, Normandy, French, were already fishing cod off a off of present day Newfoundland prior to Jacques Chrétien's arrival. And he arrived in uh, 1735, where he sailed down along the coast of Labrador and Newfoundland PEI. And he met with the Mi'kmaq people at uh, uh, Bay de la Chure and traded goods for furs. He then arrived in the Gaspé claiming, uh, claiming land for King Francis, the first of, of uh, France. And that's when the first 
interaction really happened when the, when the First Nations signed treaties with, uh, with the French. But I do plan on someday I'm going to Europe. I do plan on going to France. I do plan on going to England. And I'm going to plant the Mi'kmaq flag there as soon as I step on the land. And I'm going to claim the land for the Mi'kmaq people when, when I go there. So I'm going to repeat history, but it's going to be reverse. So someday I'm going to go across and I'm going to make that claim. Uh, of course, uh, you start having the, uh, the French and the English uh, battling over you. Uh, oh, Pam, could you go back one, please? Um, uh, the French settled in the uh, uh, island of St. Croix. That was the first uh, French fort. And of course, we all heard of Port Royal in 1605. Uh, the French were first to establish a commercial and military ally alliance with uh, indigenous people. And of course, this is, this is the word where Mi'kma'ki came up because in 1617, French claimed Mi'kma'ki as a colony of New France. Mi'kma'ki translated, translated out of Mi'kmaq means uh, uh, allies because the French and Mi'kmaq were allies. And when they entered into the, uh, into the, uh, 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 the, the, the war, uh, the battles with Britain, uh, uh, the Mi'kmaq were, were uh, allies of the French when it first started. Next one. And of course, yeah, uh, this brought on uh, the King William's War of 1688 to 1697. Uh, Britain captured Point Royal, Royal, returned it to the French in the Treaty of Rysik. And uh, that was uh, when it was returned to France. And of course, we had the Queen Anne's War in 1702 to 1713. Uh, this one here was very interesting. Or the Treaty of Upshot 1713, French ceded Acadia to Britain. And of course, uh, French retained Port Royal. That's why they got Port, uh, Port Royal back, which is, uh, you know, Cape Britain Island. Uh, and the French ceded Acadia to Britain, but the Mi'kmaq didn't consult, still had control of their ground. And this is one thing that the French said to the, uh, to the British at the time is that uh, we cannot speak on behalf of the Mi'kmaq people. You have, to, you have to go and negotiate with them or speak with them. Uh, so the, the Mi'kmaq Mi Mi still had control of Nova Scotia. Uh, British had to make peace with the Mi'kmaq, despite whether Acadia included modern day New Brunswick led to further contact because Acadia, New Brunswick wasn't prior to the, uh, those disputes at the time. Okay, next one. And of course that resulted in the uh, government change of treaties with the British. And these are a group of interconnection treaties uh, uh, that related to commitments by signed parties. And of course, these were signed with the Wabanaki Confederacy and the Wabanaki Confederacy uh, made, up, made up the four tribes of the Atlantic uh, region. And they were signed between 1725 and 1779. And what's unique about those treaties is that of course the original treaty was signed in Boston, Massachusetts in 1725. And it was ratified in 1726 by, 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 by the, uh, uh, the Wabanaki Confederacy because you got to remember traveling down from Boston up to, uh, uh, it, it took a while. And by the time First Nation people got to all their tribes and all their uh, uh, communities within their territory, it took a year to ratify. And in 1749, the treaty was uh, uh, renegotiated along with 1752 because of the city of Halifax. One of the big things about our treaties is that uh, our leaders at the time, our ancestors, made it very clear uh, for European settlement to happen in this part of, in that territory is that the First Nations had to be consulted. The First Nations had to be informed. Our people had to be informed that yes, the Europeans want to settle in this particular area and this in particular area. And Halifax was one of these areas. Halifax was a very important uh, uh, area where First Nations people hunted a lot of moose in Nova Scotia. When there was a lot of moose in that in Nova Scotia, that was a prime hunting and fishing area for First Nations. But when First Nations traveled inland in the winter time, all of a sudden uh, the city of Halifax started to spare up there. And there was a big fight over that, uh, over that territory uh, where First Nations were very upset with the fact that uh, uh, that area was settled without uh, consultation with our people or informing our people based on the treaties. And so there was a, you know, there was a big, uh, uh, ruckus over that, and there was a lot of fighting over that, and actually it stemmed right up to the Mamashi here, where uh, uh, HMS Viper came into the Mamashi here and kidnapped six of our Mi'kmaq people from the Mamashi tribe and took them back to Halifax, where they were uh, 
where they were uh, held hostage until those treaties were finally negotiated. So th that's that's part of the history people don't realize. And you always hear the uh, uh, when that treaty was settled, you always hear the term bury the hatchet. The hatchet was buried. And a lot of people don't understand that was actually a true event that actually happened. If you go and it's still there today on Citadel Hill in, 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 in Halifax, there's a hatchet and a musket buried there and it's still there. Yes, so that term buried a hatchet is not a phrase. It's actually a true event that happened with respect to the 1752 treaty that it signed and it happened. And what, what was also interesting is that uh, society as a whole would say that First Nations never had a commerce, that First Nations never had an economy. Uh, but in that 1752 treaty, the, uh, uh, the, uh, a new word appeared in the treaty and it referenced as truck houses. Truck houses were trading posts, trading posts. Truck houses were places where economy occurred, where First Nations and the tr fur traders and all that brought in their fur and they, they traded, for con traded, uh, traded goods back and forth. So the mere fact that the word truck houses were used in that treaties uh, show the fact that, uh, that First Nations uh, uh, did have a commerce. We did have a, an economy uh, and, and it was based on, uh, on uh, 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 nation to nations uh, 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 development and, and, and trading with the Europeans. Uh, the last treaty was signed in 1779. That was almost uh, subsequently with the Royal Proclamation. I'll talk about that a little further in and what that meant to First Nation people. Okay, next one. Of course, the principles and provisions behind these treaties were, of course, they're a nation to nation. Uh, we, our language is written down, our, our agreements with our communities and our tribes are written down on, on what is referred to as wampum belts. Uh, you can see a lot of these wampum belts are still in, in, intact in some First Nations and some communities, but they're also found in, 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 in you know, Canadian archives and stuff like that. And you'll see a lot of First Nations when we go out uh, we give stuff to our First Nations, or if we're in a, another First Nation territory, we bring a gift. And that was part of the treaties too, is that gift given for use of the land was also part of the, uh, you know, part of our treaties. And very important, there was absolutely no surrendering of the land. Uh, we did not surrender the land. And you'll see as we go further on that uh, that is addressed uh, within the uh, Royal Proclamation. And of course, uh, Oral promises are very important to First Nation people. Our, our history, our language, and a lot of our aspects are, are handed down orally. And that's very important. First Nations words are, 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 are ironclad with respect to our, the way we hand it down our history. And like I said, there was truck houses clauses in the, in the, in the, the last remaining treaty simply because of the fact that uh, 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 government and industry would say we did not have a commerce, but that was uh, 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 false as well. Uh, there was a sp uh, dispute resolution. British law applied with respect to, uh, uh, you know, how they would uh, govern their settlers. Uh, annual treaty ratification, of course, is done in Nova Scotia on October 7th. That's uh, October 1st, excuse me, simply because of the fact that, uh, that, uh, uh, that those tribes in that area signed a treaty even on that. Uh, the Maliseet people celebrated in June. And of course, in New Brunswick, uh, we're looking at a date simply because some of our treaties were not signed until uh, the, the 60s and 61s. And I think of the one that was signed out here in the Miramichi between uh, King John Julian. And this was a unique story here. King John Julian, who was the, the chief of the Micmac tribe, and it was signed by King Edward the, the Third. Uh, I believe, or the Fourth, the Third, uh, King Edward anyways, was signed between two kings. So if, if, if Britain did not re recognize First Nation people on the treaty, uh, it was signed by King John Julian with King Henry III. So, you know, it was signed between king and king. So if that doesn't portray land ownership, I don't know what does. Uh, next one. Of course, the uh, Royal Proclamation of 1763 was a real big... Uh, issue. Uh, it was very important to First Nations in a lot of way, but it, 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 it changed the negotiating process as Canada moved west, uh, as, as treaties kept moving west. And of course, it was signed in 1763 by King George III. 
it set out guidelines for European settlers of indigenous territory. And of course, uh, this was after the Seven Year War, but it said right there in that 1763 treaty that Aboriginal, Aboriginal title has existed and continues to exist. So it recognized the fact that there was title to this part of the world or this part of Canada and that all land would be considered indigenous land until ceded by treaties. But it had to be identified as ceded within the treaties. Now, as you moved out west, as you moved to what was designated as Treaty 3 or 3D8 or, or, or treaties that are actually title treaty compared to the covenant treaties in Mi'kmaq territory or in Wabanaki territory is that the covenant treaties do not talk about land ceding or land surrendering. As you moved out west in the treaties of, you know, uh, between Treaty 3 and Treaty 8, uh, the word ceded or, or, or accommodation was used more in the treaty simply because land was given up. But in the East Coast, it wasn't. Uh, it actually forbade settlers from claim, claiming land from in the, in indigenous occupation, occupants. There was lots of times Europeans would just move in. The word squatter was always used at, in those days. That just go in and take the land and, and more or less uh, uh, remove the indigenous aspect of the land away from that and claim it. And they couldn't do that no more. And that's why you're here. They weren't allowed to do that. And they weren't allowed to do it at the begin with, but it, it just seemed like uh, it was uh, uh, done by uh, uh, settlers just because they think it was their rights to do it. But illegally, it was being taken away. And that's why, that's why you hear things about New Brunswick, uh, the extensive land claim in New Brunswick or the extensive land claim in Nova Scotia and stuff like that. It's because of these, the, the history. It's because of the things that was done here. And one of the biggest hurdles is that Canada wasn't, Canada wasn't a country until 1867. And you know, Canada, uh, any land claim that moves forward now is based on 1867 and forward. And Canada will always say, we cannot assume the liabilities of the past or before 1867, Canada never existed uh, before 1867. That's why a lot of these big land claims go move prior towards 1867, uh, simply because of, of these treaties that were signed. They weren't recognized, they weren't, they weren't enforced properly or government just kind of uh, uh, set them aside and said, you know, we're slowly wiping out the First Nation people anyways. Eventually, they won't be here no more, so there won't be no concern. And 1867 brought, a, brought of course, the uh, 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 corralling, I would call it, of First Nation people. We were herded like cattle and were put it on, we were put on reservations. That's the Indian Act of 1867 because our population was decimated to 8,000 people in New Brunswick. You know, uh, all, all tribes together were decimated to 8,000 8, 8, people. And so uh, Britain and Canada at the time thought we were on our way out anyways, that we were going to become an extinct, extinct race, uh, much like, like the Bola Turks up in Newfoundland where they were hunted to extinction. And, uh, and, and the last, last uh, Bola Turk uh, First Nation person uh, was in the service of the queen in 1948, died in her service. You know, she was taken to Britain and that's where she died. And it's made it very clear, only, only the crown can buy land uh, from the indigenous communities. And that was nation to nation. And no other person, no other, no other land sales could happen unless it was between government and government. And and of course, there was things in the treaties that missed a lot of the First Nation input. Uh, and, and, and that made some things difficult because as soon as you moved across West, that's when Canada really kind of perfected, I hate to say, or British perfected the treaty negotiating process. And that's where you turned around and start seeding the seeding of land and the surrender of land. Uh, east of that line, or east of the Great Lakes, as this was signed in, uh, uh, there was also the Treaty of Niagara, which was roughly after this, which ratified the Royal Proclamation. A lot of people don't hear about the Treaty of Niagara, and that was in 1776, 1777. And that was ratified by 77 First Nations east of the Great Lakes. And uh, a lot of those were signed by uh, uh, the Mi'kmaq and, the, and the, well, the, the Wabanaki Confederacy nations. So next one. 
And of course, prior to the Royal Proclamations, that Section 25 of the Canadian Constitution and the Charter of Rights and Freedom mentions Royal Proclamation. And of course, Section 25, the guarantee in this Charter of Certain Rights and Freedoms shall not be construed as arbitrary disrespect for Aboriginal treaty rights and freedom pertaining to the, you know, uh, uh, the Aboriginal people of Canada. And uh, uh, the fact that the, the Constitution recognizes the uh, proclamation of 1763 uh, makes you wonder about uh, how, could, how could things keep happening the way they are happening. But if you really understand uh, how Canadian law worked with respect to First Nations, uh, you would see why First Nations uh, ended up in the predicament that they they're, were, were kind of in, but we're, we're, we're getting better. Okay, next one. Uh, this is a this is a treaty of 1779. Of course, uh, it was signed September 22nd in Windsor, Nova Scotia. Uh, it was during, of course, the American Revolution period. Uh, British signed the treaty to make peace with the Mi'kmaq because uh, uh, the British had their hands filled with the Americas that they did not want to be fighting with the Mi'kmaq people. And so, uh, and of course it mentioned non-interference with Mi'kmaq hunting and fishing. So this reaffirmed the fact that uh, our hunting and fishing rights were reaffirmed in 1779 is that the British had to find peace or make peace with the, with the Mi'kmaq people simply because of the fact they were so worried about the Mi'kmaq people siding with the Americans and, and going to war with Britain. Because I, I hate to say it, our people could fight. Uh, people were good fighters. Um, you know, you look at what Pontiac did with respect to the, the Civil War in the United States when, the, uh, I mean, excuse me, the War of 1812 when America was thinking of invading Canada, is that you had Tecumseh and Pontiac. Uh, Tecumseh took 20 of his best warriors and, and went out and made a lot of noise in the woods. And it drove the Americans back, the Americans back simply because they thought they were going to face an army of 100,000 men. But it turned out it was only 20 First Nation people that drove back the whole American army and thus gave rise to Canada. But people don't understand a lot of that history of what, what role First Nations played in even protecting this country. Because at one time, First Nations had their, uh, America's had their hands on uh, making America, the old saint, the phrase today, make America great again or greater than, they had their eyes on moving north. So of course it renewed all the previous treaties. That's why they're called the covenants of treaties because once the, thing, the unique thing about the, uh, uh, the, the, the Wabanaki treaties is that uh, it renewed the provisions that were in the last treaties. And it just built upon conditions that need to come forward. So it just built upon more things that were included based on you know, it being a living document, that this was a living document, is that as things move forward and how you know, we use terms like best practices and things like that today, so there's a lot of things missing the original treaties that were captured in the treaties, the, the follow-up treaties, and they were captured in the treaties, and they were captured again in the treaties of 1779. And that wasn't signed in Windsor, Nova Scotia. Next one. Some of the case law that you'll find interesting, like a lot of people don't understand, well, why First Nations? Why are First Nations in the predicament that we're in? Why does First Nations don't participate in society like we, like, like, nor, like what, how we're seen as normal society does? Well, prior to uh, uh, the case where I, uh, Isaac was involved in uh, 1975, there was a case before that. And you'll hear it talked about more and more actually that First Nation people in Canada never had the right to hire a lawyer. We could not get representation. Uh, we were not allowed to have reputation in, 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 in any Canadian court system, be it provincial or federal. So the first court case that ever went forward was based on the fact that First Nations, in order to fight, in order to protect uh, uh, rights, and in order to get treaties, uh, uh, to get treaties, you know, uh, to a point where it recognized our rights, we had to get legal representation. That case took 21 years, and it made it to the Supreme Court of Canada. And finally, in 1971, it said that the uh, First Nations have the right to have legal representation in the Canadian court system. So that was the first case. The next case that came out in, the, in our area here was of course, was a, was a case in 1775, uh, was called the Gray, uh, Gray case. And it was, a, represent, it was a, a right for First Nations to hunt and fish 
on our own reserve territory, in our own communities, is that we could not go out and, uh, up until up prior to 1975 to go out and snare a rabbit on our land, uh, on reservations. We weren't allowed to do that. And so people would ask, uh, how could we survive? Uh, no, how could one person survive if we're not even allowed to practice what society as a whole practice that we respect to out and get and hunt and that food? We weren't even allowed to do that. So this case finally upheld the rights to hunt and fish, like right here in the yield ground. To go out and fish in my front yard or go out and trap a rabbit in the backyard here up in the woods here so I can feed. That was the first case that ever won here. And of course, then we had R, R versus Paul in 1980, where, where uh, 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 the 1779 treaty was uh, upheld with respect to Mi'kmaq treaties, right to fish. And of course, uh, we had the Simon case after that, the same thing, right and fish. And then, of course, uh, we had the uh, Dene Paul and Silbo in 1990, the same thing, the right to fish. Uh, for food. And what was so ironic about this that First Nations are the only group of people that, depending on what the courts come down with, uh, the right to fish, all of a sudden it would be defined. The right to fish a salmon, the right to fish a bass, the right to fish, you know, a cod, a right to fish a trout. You know, it came so segmented that First Nation had to fight for every little aspect of implementing the treaty right where uh, society as a whole, if you had the right to fish and the right to hunt, you can go out and fish and hunt. It never broke it down into various uh, species or various times of years. And of course, the big case was the uh, uh, R versus Marshall, where Marshall gave us the right to uh, not only fish, but also to uh, sell. And the unique thing about Marshall, it does not just talk about the sell, selling of fish. It, does, it talks about the selling of fauna, uh, plants, animals, fish, all that kind of stuff. It does not limit itself to what he was fishing at the time, eels. It includes pretty well any living thing that you commercially can sell a value on. That's how, that's how I defined in Marshall was. And Marshall was the only case to go back to the Supreme Court of Canada and Supreme Court in, in Canadian history to get a second rule into it. And then later on in 2006, we had the, uh, the right to harvest wood. But then again, we got to go and fight for stiff particular species. Uh, there's another case that recently come out. It's called the Reynolds case. It's not in here. It should have been in here, but it's, it, it might be on another slide here, but I'm not sure. The Reynolds case, which uh, the province of New Brunswick uh, wanted to control First Nation moose hunting. And uh, uh, because of Marshall, uh, we had the right to actually commercialize the moose harvest if we wanted. Uh, but First Nations do believe in conservation. We're very strong on conservation. We believe in the protection of the animals. So a lot of our cases that come out, we don't go, we don't go berserk, berserk over and start uh, uh, implementing them like a lot of society we do as a whole. They're like there's certain aspects of society if all of a sudden they had the right to go to kill all the deer and make a living off them, there wouldn't be a deer left in this province because they'll go do it. Um, but the Reynolds case was a case brought forward uh, uh, about four years ago where a, a Mi'kmaq, a, a Maliseet hunter was charged as an accessory uh, in taking a moose that was uh, uh, sold to a non-Indigenous person or traded, there was actually traded for a Dodge Durango a truck uh, to a, to a non-Indigenous person. Both of them were charged, but the courts later found out that it was the province's way to try to circumvent its way around controlling the treaty right when it comes to harvesting and selling moose. And the courts told the province, you can't do that. So theoretically, right now, under the Reynolds case, we have the right to commercialize a moose hunt. So we can go out and sell moose if we want it now based on the Reynolds case. But you don't see First Nations going crazy and doing that because that's not who we are as a people. However, with the way the lobster cases in, in, in are going with respect to making a moderate live, livelihood is that we're not going to wait, First Nations are not going to wait for 20 years to, uh, to see if government would respect and define a martyr's livelihood. We find it so difficult of why it's so hard to de define a modern livelihood where you can just go to Stats Canada and what does an average family of four require in order to survive in today's economy? You know, I think it's around 50, $55,000 a year. So why is it so hard 
to identify a martyr's livelihood for First Nation people too. To me, to us, it's just a stall tactic of not wanting to answer the question. But here we now, with respect to Marshall, 20 years after the fact, and we're still fighting over how to access a modern livelihood other, other than lobster fishery. So next one. How do we build in relationships? Well, of course, right now, one of the very important things is that society as, as a whole uh, de depends on uh, uh, knowledge. Uh, and how much scientific information is, av is available on particular resources. Uh, we're constantly asked about indigenous knowledge, indigenous knowledge. But because we were so suppressed by government policy and by the way, um, especially in Canada, by the Indian Act, of how First Nations were so, so uh, repressed and so put down on, uh, on exercising our rights and exercising our way, we are in we're are, we're are on the path of re-identifying ourselves and, re, and bringing our knowledge out. So we are in the path of bringing out our indigenous knowledge, but we're very protective of that indigenous knowledge. When we're asked about, well, did you use the land before? Did you use the land? Of course, you know, to us that's a stupid question. We always have to use the land. We always had to use the land in secrecy because of the Indian Act, because we had to take everything to court with respect to our rights and using the land. So going out to harvest ash, going out to pick berries, going out to pick medicine, all that, we're, do we're done so secretly uh, up until some of these court cases grow because we were never ever allowed to. We, we would be ostracized or, or shot at or bounties put on our heads by one gov uh, governor out in Nova, Nova Scotia, the Cornwallis, about taking the scalp off, his, off our heads because uh, 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 there was bounties put on First Nation. And society as the whole thinks that uh, uh, society as a whole thinks that the scalping was the thing that First Nation people did. Yeah, that was brought in by white society. That was a that was a a, a governor's uh, a declaration on how to control the Indian population. Uh, and you could buy a hate pardon the pun, but you could buy a farm with with the bounties that were put on First Nations head for their scalp. It was 125 pounds for a uh, a male of 16 years and uh, older. It was 75 pounds for a female uh, and it was uh, 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 75 shillings, whatever a shilling was, I think it was left, for, for a child under 16, you know? And to us, that's genocide, putting a bounty on our people. That's why First Nations talk about genocide simply because of the fact there was bounties put on our heads uh, uh, by government at the time. And it's still in the books. It hasn't been reprieved. It's still, it's still part of, uh, uh, you know, history when it comes to Canada. That's why you had such a uproar when it come to uh, uh, tearing down Cornwallis's uh, statue uh, was because of what he done to First Nation people, what he brought forward to First Nation people. Um, so we're doing Indigenous land use studies now, like MTI now we have, we have 15 on the go. Uh, some sectors are very receptive, like the peat moss sector and all that, but forestry is the biggest hurdle. We find forestry so hard to deal with simply because of the monopoly in this, uh, in this province by what we call the yellow machine. They have total control over the forest here, despite what the government and the industry would say is that, uh, you know, they don't. Uh, but what's really frustrating is that uh, we currently have uh, the forest management agreements uh, that were signed by government and uh, industry in 2014 were in court over them simply because of the fact if you ever get a chance to read those forest management agreement clause 7.6 gives uh, government I mean gives industry total uh, control over whether certain management activities happen they have final say whether management activity happens uh, which has to be approved by industry uh, prior to government implementation. So, you know, that was very disappointing where we find that, uh, uh, you know, the caretakers of what people see as public lands being government has totally relinquished control over to industry. So here we have a person, here, here we have, uh, uh, you know, aspects of uh, resource utilization being taken from the public uh, in the, in the industry has more say than the, the, the government that people has put in there with respect to regulating those things. So we have 15, 10 are completed and these are all made public. And what it does, it goes out and identifies all the land use that was done by First Nation people in the past, uh, what we can capture, but it also identifies 
what land use is happening today. And that includes everything from hunting to fishing to trapping to the berry collecting medicine planet, and the utilization of tree species and stuff like that. And at anyone we did uh, 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 land use studies with, uh, like Maritime Electric, Berger, uh, East Coast Industry, uh, Anglin Parish, but I can think of many more now because this 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 was done you know about four or five years ago, uh, you know with SunGrow, uh, Scotts Canada, um, uh, you know. Uh, a lot of the IK work done, they were amazing how, how they complement the scientific knowledge, how they could fit together and work, work in sync with each other, is that certain questions that the scientific body had, First Nations had the answers to, and vice versa, First Nation uses a lot of the scientific information out there now, because it does help our case with respect to, uh, you know, what we have been saying about the land, it backs us up. Sometimes it, uh, it, it's, it, it takes a little longer for science to catch up uh, to indigenous knowledge, uh, but likewise, indigenous knowledge ain't released as easily as it can be simply because of the mistrust uh, that a lot of our communities still have with government and industry uh, because we are in that relationship building stage and hopefully it will get better over time. A lot of those studies can be found on, on a, a Mi'kmaq site. Uh, uh, next one, Pam. How do, we, how, do we, how do we plan on going forward? Of course, our chiefs, we negotiate. Uh, Mi'kmaq, uh, we look at a lot of projects. Uh, the, the thing Mi'kmaq, the, the, the thing MTI does, and this is what society don't have, every time we have projects coming to us, uh, you know, my project is only small scale to everything that's happening on the land. Our projects is only small scale. And uh, 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 projects being small scale, what the, what the big thing people don't look at is the cumulative effect of all those projects, of all that activity on the land, of how does it affect our rights as treaties? The cumulative effect is unbelievable. Uh, there's not a spot, uh, it's similar to, uh, it's similar to uh, wildlife corridors and forestry where industry will always say, well, we got this patch of land, we're gonna, we're gonna attach a little corridor to this patch of land. We're gonna leave a little strip of wood along this uh, water course so the animals can track to that strap of land. First Nations feel like that because when the treaties were originally signed, it was 100% of the land base. We're down to 50% of the land base now simply because of society's whole interpretation of land ownership, private land versus crown land versus uh, you know uh, other land. Uh, Mi'kmaq territory has been chewed down to 50% of the land base. And that's a Mi'kmaq territory. And in Maliseet territory, it's even worse simply because of the fact that uh, western part of this uh, province is virtually owned by industry, you know, a lot of industrial freehold land there. So all that land was removed from the, their territory, and and now they say that you don't have access to it like they do, and 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 and, and that shouldn't be. We never gave up title to the land. None of us gave up title to the land, so access should be still there. But we're we're starting to feel much like the moose. We're starting to feel much like the animals out there. Where we want to use our land, we got to follow these little corridors to get from block to block to land. You know, we got to follow these little corridors. And I remember one person in forestry saying to me one time, "He goes, Steve, you know, I'm a maple sugar operator. I don't, I don't, I don't have the effect on the land that forestry does." And I looked at him. I said, "Well, you have a bigger effect on the land uh, when it comes to accessing by First Nations." He goes, what do you mean? I said, you know, uh, you know, I don't agree with clear cut and uh, a lot of big clear cut and stuff like that. But I say, yes, when industry goes in there and does a clear cut, uh, it does it does have an effect on the land base for sure, in our opinion, because they're too big for one thing. And but we can still access it. But I said, when you put your sugar tubes out, when you put your 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 tube and then on, from tree to tree, and if we go harvest a moose on the adjacent piece of block, and that moose runs by and goes through all your all your um, all, all your all your infrastructure work when it comes to collecting that syrup, you're not going to be a happy camper. But by the fact that you put that uh, put all that infrastructure in to harvest the maple sugar, you're infringing on our rights to access that piece of land simply because uh, uh, we can't access it no more. Would you like the fact that if I put a trap line through your sugar bush, are you gonna are you gonna uh, harp about it because you got a lease? I said that lease means nothing to us because that lease is signed with the government of Canada. We have treaties, uh, government of New Brunswick. We have treaties signed with the with the government of Canada protecting our rights. But when the government turns around and takes that, uh, when the government of New Brunswick turns around and leases that land out to you as a private owner, it affects our rights. 
So, you know, they don't understand the full uh, interpretation of how, of how that affects it. And there's a particular beetle right now that's attacking the ash tree, the emerald ash borer, a beetle. And to us, that's a direct infringement on our ray of life. You know, the commerce of this, the, com the commerce of Canada by allowing these imports coming into the country because of the fact that goods are, you know, we talk about globalization. But you look at the amount of beetles and the amount of uh, 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 exotic species that have been introduced in this part of, in, into North America, into Turtle Island, because of, the, because of the economic commerce of this country. This beetle came into New Brunswick, came into uh, uh, Canada through uh, uh, Detroit and Windsor uh, in 1999. I remember myself uh, talking about uh, talking about uh, uh, the fact that this beetle, there's no really defense against it, even though for the last 20 some years we've been trying to the, 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 the get a defense on it. But it will wipe out every ash tree uh, in Eastern Canada. It's doing it now. The latest find, of course, has been in Fredericton where the beetle has been found in some trees there. There's no really forestry application in place now to see if it's actually attacking forestry stands. So here we have a beetle that's gonna wipe out uh, uh, the making of black ash baskets. Uh, and that of course has a cultural, ceremonial, economic and spiritual aspect to First Nation communities that's been practiced for 10,000 years. And now it's on the verge of being wiped out. It's being destroyed. It's going to be, there's no, no talk around the, uh, how you're going to accommodate First Nations so that ain't lost. How are you going to uh, stop the infringement of a way of life? And that's a direct violation of the treaties is that, uh, you know, this beetle that's been introduced into, uh, into, into New Brunswick, man, it's here now. Uh, it's going to have a, a great effect. So, you know, there's so many things I can talk about with respect to forestry, but one thing I, I want to show is that I still got my tweak collection that's 40 years old. Wow. That tweak, that tweak collection is 40 years old. <laughs> I still have it. Yes. So those, all those tweaks that you see there, they still have the buds and everything on it. Those are all 40 year old tweaks. Wow. And I still have that. It has all the species that are in this area. And what's unique about this, I have uh, 71 species of trees here. And there's one thing that I did, my yard out here yes. has all 71 species growing yes, out here. Sir. I planted every one of them. And of course, over the years, I collected all the leaves that are associated with all those. Wow. Those are all, those are all the leaves all pressed in, everything from uh, oh. maple, your birch and all that kind of the stuff. Red. So. But I was hoping, this is why I'd like to get out on the land because I find this stuff dry. It's, it's, uh, it, it, it's informative, but being out on the land and actually showing this stuff, like, you know, there's, there, there's a black ash twig that's 40 years old and the bud and everything is still intact. Wow. You know, so, you know, that's, uh, and that's, that's the, uh, right here, it's right here are the tree ashes and those are the beetle, the beetle is killing them. So, you know, it's uh, having that hands-on experience and having, having the, you know, the, uh, the kids, the children to go to do that is uh, incredible. Like, uh, you know, who, who knows what a huckleberry bush looks like, you know, and, and this is the time of year you go out and uh, from fall time to now, you, you collect these twigs and makes it a lot easier in the springtime to identify your trees when you're trying mm -hmm. to learn your species of trees. And spring has arrived. The and buds are coming out as we speak. I uh, just, I, I wanted to offer you earlier, Steve, a little pouch of tobacco. I'm doing it, you know, virtually and just say that the chat has got wonderful feedback. I'm going to have to share with you later as our next guest has arrived. But what a wealth of knowledge and history and really your storytelling abilities are phenomenal and we could all I'm sure listen to you for hours. Um, I will just gladly take one or two comments if there are any quick thank yous or wallalans before I sign over to um, 
our next guest who has partnered and allied with uh, Tobik First Nation to do some green energy projects. So Steve, I, I, I know we share a history for sure um, as a non-Indigenous and an Indigenous friend. Uh, and I like to think that there's hope and that reconciliation is happening uh, before our very eyes and before our youth's very eyes. And uh, you are a huge part of allowing us in and sharing your stories. It means the world. Well, I appreciate the time. Uh, for those who know me, I do get long-winded sometimes. <laughs> I was hoping I didn't for a few questions. But I don't, I don't see the clock when I talk, eh? I did. I don't, I don't look at the watch when I clock, when I talk. I just talk, and sometimes I try to cut things short. But uh, it's just so much information to try to get out, and you just can't get it all out, eh? No. And it's difficult. Uh, at least when you're out in the land and you're walking, you could take a little more time. Yes, and we are going to. We are going to get up there, and we are going to have some eel together, and we are going to learn on the land. But you know what? You've taught us that the story. We can still learn from the land by listening and listening to you and listening to those before you um, share their experiences. You've got, thanks, Steve. Great to see you again from Chris. Very informative. You're never at a loss for words. Take care, my friend. Wonderful presentation from Rosanna Lamb. Thank you for sharing your knowledge from, uh, that was from me, actually. I apologize for the mouse all over the place. Uh, Delbert Moulton from Tobik, very good presentation on treaties and very informative with facts. And it goes on, Steve, I will say thank you on behalf of us all. And uh, please feel free to stay in. Oh, a former student from Kingsclear First Nation. Amazing. Thank you for your time. Um, bye, everyone from Wild Outside, which is a youth outdoor education program so you are getting the feedback it's quietly been placed in the chat yeah, yeah i see it there and thank you very much thank you for your time i'm glad i had the time and chris it's good to see you again buddy it's been a while yes. see you, see you. take care everybody yeah you too we'll we'll cross paths eventually hope so yes. yeah, yeah.